What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Primark Purpose. This is a series in which I go in reverse legion order and give my thoughts, ideas, opinions on what I think perhaps the ultimate goal, end game goal, might have been for the particular Primark in question from the Primark Project. The Emperor did the Primark Project with, I think, a definite blueprint in mind because each Primark is individually handcrafted and made different from each other. They get whisked away, and we never get to really see their purpose come to true fruition because the heresy happens at the end of the Great Crusade. Primarchs die, Primarchs go traitor. So we never get to see it happen. In that regard, I make a bit of a what-if setting, and I've been doing so for this entire series. It all encompasses the same setting. It's a what-if setting, so it's not the true setting of 40k, but it's not that radical. It's two changes, but they are massive changes, particularly for the Imperium. And chaos but the 40k setting as a whole really doesn't on the onset on the outside is looking over it doesn't change that dramatically but it's still far-reaching changes it's still some major changes so i'll go over those changes for what the setting is that we're looking at you know through the lens of that setting to look at these primarchs and then we'll get to the primarch so firstly the emperor is alive and well leading an imperial truth driven imperium following the conclusion successfully of the great crusade this doesn't mean the imperium you know sits on every world in the galaxy the territory of the imperium more or less is going to stay the same or be near the same size as it is in standard 40k this is due to the astronomicon beacon and other factors so the territory size isn't necessarily going to change with that said, Imperial Truth is the law of the land of this Imperium, not the Ecclesiarchy's God Emperor worship. This means we have some changes in the Imperium's structure. There is no Ecclesiarchy, no need for it. Therefore, there's no Ecclesiarchal forces, meaning no sisters of battle as we know it. The concept of a war orphaned military force, a force um, that exists of nothing but war orphaned individuals and these war orphans could be all female if you wanted to be still can still exist it just wouldn't be like the sisters we know at all so no ecclesiarchy or its forces no need for it and because the heresy didn't happen we don't have a plan b c d and all that jazz so we don't have the inquisition as we know it or its forces either no death watch no gray knights the legions kind of take up that role the different legions together so you have that we still have xenos we're still going to have you know, the eldar the orcs we're still going to have tyranny show up tau come to power necrons reawaken all of the xeno stuff is still going to happen but um it's just a different imperium that is dealing with it to this end the second major change is all of the known primarch are alive and loyal leading their legion still so there's no successor chapter there's no foundings to happen there's no chaos warbands of space marines but uh we still have traitor guard we're still going to have renegade human forces we're still going to have dark mechanical and that forbidden technology fruit is still going to be um, a lure that's too strong to resist for some uh tech priests and you can even have chaos demonic incursions be a threat the uh, borders between reality and the warp can still be kind of fractured and uh, wearing down. And you even have chaos subjugating and and um, turning Xenos to their cause. I always thought that they should be doing stuff like that anyway. But they kind of just been limited to a human-only corruption for whatever reason. Anyways, um, so you still can have stuff like that happening. But those are the two massive changes and then it is in this setting that i'm going to be looking at the last primark to talk about which means we are talking about the first primark we're talking about the lion now i deliberately waited for book nine and it's here so i guess we continue on with this series and we get to talk about the last primark to talk about who is the first primark now being the first isn't really a purpose it's just uh, sheer random chance that you're the first really um yes the first legion really did pave the way for the rest of the legions but that 
isn't really going to be a factor into the purpose of the Primarch. However, aspects of the First Legion can definitely be used to get a sense of what the purpose of the Primarch might have been, as well as looking up the Primarch's deeds in the actual lore of 40k in the actual setting. So, the Dark Angel's Legion is gifted a fleet of relic ships by the Emperor, where the Emperor only gifts a small handful to the rest of the Legions. They're also solely um, allowed and given the armories and weapons of Old Knight, an ancient tech of Terra from the Dark Age of Technology. They alone are allowed to wield this tech. No other Legion, not even the Mechanicum, has any access to it. The Lion, once he is found, is given a unique protocol he can enact, unique of all the Primarchs. The Lion on Caliban has a parallel with his Legion. His Legion fights the truly dangerous foes during the Unification Wars when they are part of it. Uh, they exist as 10,000 where other Legion forces are barely a, a, a few companies at best, maybe a thousand or so at best for the, for the rest of the Legions. So they are truly in Legion format, you could say, during the Unification Wars and able to act as such. And during their early days of the Great Crusade, they are the sword and shield in the darkness. They fight against the monsters and fallout of Old Night during the early days of the Great Crusade, leaving no stone unturned and utterly eradicating, making extinct and erasing from history threats so dire that we can't know about them. They are under binding oath of secrecy within the Legion and within the uh, archives of the Emperor. They are a threat too dire to ever know to be of existence. The lion survived against the death world jungle of Caliban and then led forces to slay those monsters. In both sense, the lion and his legion are like the knights who slay the dragon or the beast. They are not the knights that save the damsel in distress necessarily, but they are the knights that are written about that go forth and slay the mighty dragon or other monster. So, when unified with each other, the lion continues his uh, ruthless pragmatism and efficiency. He is considered to be the most pragmatic and ruthlessly efficient of his brothers. A direct kind of description of him. And with his special protocols he can enact, and with the weapons of old night and dark age of technology from Terra at their disposal uniquely, the First Legion is a powerhouse, and they go forth and they slay things. And while we do learn about some of their battles, many of their battles, most of their battles, we don't learn about. And it is through all of this, and even in Battles in the Horus Heresy, where we see the Lion make use of things, and even hunt down and find, for example, the Tuchula engine to make use of it, we see further proof of his pragmatic, ruthlessly efficient ways. Basically... If the forest has to be burned down, the lion will burn down the forest without question. Other Primarchs might try to find another way. Not for the lion. This is the path to victory. We know this will achieve victory. We just need to burn down the forest. It can be regrown by the rest later. Burn it down. And that's what he'll do. That's that's his mindset, you could say. Um, he has said that unlike his brothers, and unlike other legions... They are not conquerors. He and his legion are not conquerors. They are destroyers. There's a difference. And this is a really good way to define the difference between the 1st and the 13th, where you could draw a lot of parallels uh, during the legion time period. The 13th are warrior kings. They build empires, literally, uh, amongst their victories. The 1st do not. The 1st leave no stone upon stone. They leave nothing left standing they eradicate from history whatever they fought against render it utterly extinct right the only reason we know about the rangdan wars is because so much of the imperium at the time was involved in it but even outside of the fact that it happened it and all that we don't know too much because the dark angels had to silence a lot of the information out of necessity but outside of that we don't know too much about what the dark angels really have done we learn about it in Book 9, but we also learn that it's all a secret. Anyways, tangent over. My point is that for the lion, they're here to eradicate the foe utterly. There's a whole 
department of the Imperium, aka the rest of the Imperium, that can grow the crops, build the cities, repopulate the center, and so on. They are here to give that team the means to do so by destroying the enemy utterly, and then they move on to do it again. That is how the Lion views his existence and his legion, and he's content with that. He is loyal to the Emperor and his empire, and is content in killing for them to make sure that that empire is safe and, and grows and it becomes reality. So this is what I feel the ultimate purpose for the Lion is, and therefore his legion. They are the knights on constant crusade against the monsters of the galaxy. They are not necessarily uniquely alone in this, but they are kind of unique in the fact that they would maintain a ever-present crusade level of status and activity. They would be the, the Legion and the Primarch most often not seen much at all within the boundaries of the Imperium, outside of Caliban and their one other fortress world. They would they have, you know, recruitment type things from other planets, yes, but they only really maintain Caliban and one other world. And they um wouldn't really be seen much outside of those two worlds and Terra. The Primarch especially would hardly be seen. He'd be known to exist and he'd be talked about in kind of just hush whispers of awe amongst the populace because he's the first. And being the first, you just are known by proxy most of the time. And um, at the same time, not much would be known about him. It'd be a lot of legend and hearsay. And I think outside of massive orc wars that happen within Imperial space and other massive calamities that require multiple legion re uh, responses, we wouldn't really see the lion and his legion show up in real space outside of situations most dire in which they are in a position to respond efficiently. Of course, they'll respond then um, once news reaches them or they are directly contacted. But outside of that, they will be, as it said in Star Wars, beyond the Outer Rim. They will be beyond the boundaries of the Imperium killing for the Emperor. Not like barbarians or berserkers, but just being those ruthlessly efficient monster-slaying knights, if you will, with the weapons and the fleet to do so. Which means they are in a position to be uh, some of the first contacts with Xeno species that we hear about in the lore but don't have codices for, as well as being perhaps likely to make first contact with Tyranids. They and the Khan are the two, or the Lion and the Khan are the two most, uh, I think, likely candidates for potentially meeting the Tyranids beyond the borders of the Imperium, therefore having first contact. And because they come in from for the first Tyrannic War towards the ultramarine space, the only one could also make first contact. Regardless of who does, I think all three would be the ones to fight against them first. And in the Dark Angels and the Lion make contact first, most of that war is going to happen beyond the official boundaries of the Imperium with some spillover into it, I think, compared to how it happens uh, in standard 40k fluff. So they would be a force to make first contact that way. They might even make uh, retaliatory strikes outward and maybe not so much going into the intergalactic void in any real sense of getting in there, but maybe, um, you know, hounding and pushing back or doing whatever they can and then uh, keeping kind of vigil for where the first Tyrannic uh, fleet came from here and there, you know, making it part of their active patrol beyond Imperial space. Who knows? So with that said, um, they would just be an ever constant crusading force, most often not seen within the Imperium proper, but talked about in legend, just because that's what happens when you're not seen much. So that is my thought for the lion's purpose, just to be the ever crusading force, that, that killer, that destroyer of the enemy, but in a knight slaying the dragon type of concept. With that said, that's my thoughts on the lion, and that is the last Primarch to talk about. I will do um, a kind of 
conclusionary-esque video. It might be one video, it might be two, I'm not sure yet. It depends on how I talk about the topic at hand, but this is the last primark to talk about. There might be one to, well, there will be at least one, maybe two more videos for this series, kind of wrapping things up. So thanks very much for sticking through it. It's been a long time coming because I specifically waited for Book 9 to come out for this primark. But it's been a lot of fun. I enjoy doing a primark purpose. Um, it's by no means, of course, I'll say this now and I'll say it again in the uh, wrap-up ramble. This is by no means a definitive truth or law or rules. It's just some thoughts for the fun of it and it's been fun to do. So thanks very much for sticking through with this series. Hopefully you enjoyed. Share your thoughts in the comment section below. And until the next one, take it easy.